Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our Science Cafe. Tonight we welcome Dr. Giuseppe Taibi for a chat on generative AI, navigating the risks and rewards. My name is Helen Liu and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. The Foundation plays a key role with the Science Cafe series and produces the content for these programs. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. We're running this program in a hybrid format. We will have time for questions at the end of the program. At that time, if you are joining us in person, please raise your hand and I will bring a microphone over. For our attendees on Zoom, please submit your questions to the Q&A. Jagesh Shah will be your host for the evening. Jagesh is a distinguished scientist with a background in biology, computation, and engineering. He is also a Lexington resident former Cary Library Foundation board member and the creator of the Science Cafe series. Jigesh, welcome. I'm now to have the evening off to you to host and introduce our special guest for the evening. Uh, thank you, Helen, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is a good turnout for the first fall Science Cafe, so I'd like to see everybody uh, here. And uh, before we start, I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge our online community. And uh, again, uh, please put your uh, questions into the Q&A there, and then we'll be able to make sure that we go after them uh, during the Q&A session. And I also want to just double thanks the Cary Memorial uh, Foundation, um, Library Foundation, because they do support all of these uh, programming uh, for, for the Science Cafe and others. So this evening, I'm delighted to welcome uh, to the Science Cafe, Dr. Giuseppe Taibi. So, so he made sure that I got that right, and uh, and uh, I think that's important. So I, I think Giuseppe is actually somebody who has written a few different ways. So you know, like everybody talks about how they change careers many times. Uh, Giuseppe is an engineer and an entrepreneur, but has written many of the kind of technology changes that we have seen over the course of just our our lifetime. He's been at the forefront of web, mobile, cloud, and what we're going to talk about today, which is uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, he obtained his PhD in artificial intelligence, and he'll tell us a little bit about that as well, uh, at the University of Palermo in Sicily. Uh, then he moved to Boston, and we'll hear a little bit about what that transition must have been like, uh, to combine AI and at the time signal processing to look at uh, polyphonic sounds in scenes. So, you know, again, we'll talk a little bit about graduate school. I think it's always one of my favorite topics. You go to school and then you go to school some more. And uh, why would you want to do that? And so it's, uh, I think it's a, we'll get a little bit of a taste of how you get that early, early training. Um, he went out into the industry, worked at QuitNet using web to drive behavior for healthcare, Waga, where he built some of the first mobile apps for sports and fitness. Uh, and he's currently at Ampliforce, which is developing enterprise scale generative AI solutions for addressing workforce sort of shortage. So I think that they will have a good, a good amount of discussion on that, I'm sure. Uh, we'll talk, we'll walk through kind of your background and, and uh, where you are now and really get to the heart of what is generative AI? How does it differ from maybe some of the things that we've seen before? And what do we expect it can do for us? Uh, and outside of the tech realm, I don't know, he has a few uh, familiar faces in here. So they'll know that he imports award-winning extra virgin olive oil from his family farm in Southern Sicily. So, and I know a number of people have benefited from that. Um, uh, and he's a local Lexington resident. And, I, and we were just uh, uh, saying that the first few, probably the first 10 science cafes that I did were all from people whose kids I coached in Lexington soccer, who would sit around on the side of the, and read paper. So I knew they were scientists while I was watching their girls run around and uh, chase the ball. So. Giuseppe is amongst that uh, kind of distinguished group uh, there. So welcome, Giuseppe. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Jagas. Very, very happy to be here. Um, so I think we like to start at the beginning, your beginning. So, you know, where did you grow up? And what were some of those early interactions with technology and science that kind of brought you there? Love the question. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, so. I grew up in Sicily, in southern Sicily. So if you think about Europe, uh, we really are at the border. You know, uh, the window from my from my bedroom 
uh, all about uh, the Greek town that was founded 2,600 years ago. And then we have the Mediterranean uh, open, open sea. And on the other side, there's North Africa. Okay, so that's uh, how much of the periphery of Europe that I was born. And, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of the, the start. And uh, from there, I developed, like, a I started to play video games. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was not a whole lot of good stuff, so we had to make <laughs> believe almost uh, with things like Atari. I happened to choose uh, the, the Mattel version, the Intellivision. And I was like uh, really having fun, and then uh, I was curious. One day I was like, how does this thing work? How do I control this dot on the screen? And that's what kind of sparked my curiosity. I was lucky enough that I had like a a natural affinity for math and science and technology. If I also was in high school and there in Italy, we have a different system, just gonna touch upon that very quickly, where you go to middle school, elementary school, middle school, and then you have to choose which kind of high school do you want to go to. We don't even call it high school, and it's five years. Uh, and basically you choose either the two main type of high school are the one for humanities, which is called Liceo Classico, and the one for science, and that's called Liceo Scientifico. So I went to Liceo Scientifico because I had this, this, this interest, this affinity. And then I, again, I wanted to learn how to make these things. I wanted to be on the other side, not just the, 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 the kid who plays games, but how do they... And so that sparked me the interest in uh, figuring out programming. Okay, still in high school, I start to lobby my parents <laughs> to get me a computer. And at that time, there were only a handful of kids who were like interested in that. And, but you know, somehow, by buying video game magazines, I remember in the last pages they were like, uh, "Here is how you can type this basic thing to learn." Half, half of the time it didn't work, but you still try. You know, eventually when I got my computer and started, so that's what kind of got me started. And so when it came time to go to college, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to have access to one of the greatest uh, universities that we have in Italy, which happens for engineering at least, which happens to be the right in Sicily in Palermo. And so I enrolled up there. And at that time, there wasn't really software mm. as a specialization, but there was uh, uh, electronics. Mm. So. And you don't get to see any electronics uh, until the third year <laughs> on a five-year program. You get to study a lot of basic physics, uh, chemistry, uh, thermodynamics, uh, um, like uh, matrix calculus and all that. And then eventually you start learning about, about semiconductors. So I kind of was fortunate enough that at that time uh, there was actually a group uh, of uh, professors there that were like actually studying the AI hmm. kind of, uh, I would call that was in a department yet, and eventually the became was more like a group. But and also there was um, a, an interdisciplinary uh, center for uh, knowledge technologies, hmm. and that's where there were like uh, mathematicians. Uh, the members of the physics department and the medical doctors. Cool. And so to me, you know, I was uh, super fascinated by that. To me, the, 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 when I learned about what's possible with, with AI, I just started to dream all sort of possibilities. But I'll, I'll stop here, give you a chance to kind of carry on the conversation. Well, no, I, I, I think it'll have two hours. So no, I know. <laughs> We have a lot of time, so we'll cover a lot of. But I do think that this um, this is going to be, I think, a theme, which is the fact that you know you're working in areas where there is this so-called convergence, right? Where a number of fields all benefit from um, infrastructure for knowledge, and you know, kind of the web, the cloud, you know, like all of these things. It's uh, it's not just how you structure the knowledge, it's how you access it, and I think. I think what we'll get to is that the AI is the flip side of that, right? It's taking that structured information and then kind of feeding it back and actually predicting, you know, what's going to happen. So I, we're going to get there, but it clearly you had those early roots in understanding how, again, this is, you know, this is early days of AI. This is early days. Yeah, yes. those are early days. And so, so what really spawned the interest in further schooling? 
I mean, you know, like kind of a PhD is, uh, you know, I, I don't think everybody knows what they're getting themselves into when they get a PhD, but they think, hey, this will be fun. I was good at school. I'll be good at school more. Um, it's not, it doesn't always turn out that way. But no, <laughs> yeah, no it's a very good point. I have a question. What kind of, what, what's wrong with you, man? <laughs> it's like, you know, the more like humble way of putting it. Um, well, you know, it's, uh, it's almost like you scratch the surface of certain topics and uh, you have a chance uh, to go deeper and you know, like you kind of want to continue. Also, again, I was fortunate enough that uh, the academic environment there was fantastic. Uh, lots of friends uh, and great, great faculty. Also, you, you become part of a national school of um, doctorate and that's, you know, you get to, to meet a lot of others uh, in other in our communities uh, and also there's another excellent option that is offered to you if you are in fact uh, a doctorate student which uh, lets the, the Italian government basically sponsors you automatically okay um, to go abroad for a year and a half so at that point basically the first year and a half I did, uh, I did the Palermo in Italy, and then uh, I had to decide, like, where do I want to go? So then I had, like, a free ticket to go anywhere. So I basically, like, uh, at first, uh, to be honest, I wanted to go to Paris, because I like Paris. <laughs> 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 I figured, eh, you know, Paris, yes, but it's, like, not exactly the epicenter of, I mean, there are great cafes and libraries and whatever, but, like, if you're going to be doing some serious work uh, on, uh, on technology, you got to go to the United States. You know, for the uh, late 90s, it wasn't like a very simple, even though we had some internet, but it was like not that good and like it was not the same. But you know, some of the colleagues uh, that I had studied with uh, in uh, my university in Palermo already were in the United States. So I was able to kind of go actually to meet them and visit various uh, campuses. And, uh, you know, I went to the West Coast, uh, I went to New York, uh, and then I, I stayed in Boston for last, huh? yeah. and I was like, oh my god, this is great. <laughs> I love what Boston. time of year did you come here? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's an excellent question, because it was like late April. Yeah. So the snow was already kind of melting, and like, it didn't feel that like terrible. Plus, but I have to tell you, this is another funny, funny fact, real fact, too. So, when I was, one of the challenges for me to be doing research in AI, which is kind of who could I talk to about this stuff? Only a handful of people in season, right? But also, like, how do I justify exactly to be inside a, a computer room, okay, when the weather outside is gorgeous and all my friends out of the beach and I'm there like figuring out uh, in the knowledge base and the ontology and write the paper, right? So Boston in the winter actually was very appealing to me because uh, now when outside is snowing and everybody is inside with their coffee and their computer it feels okay that feels like I'm not missing any fun. <laughs> so it's so a very northeast thing, right? It's like oh I can work harder in the winter time. Right. So, uh, uh, plus, so, yeah. Plus Boston, of course, and MIT, and you know, one of the things that I read actually in Italian, I read the book uh, that was written by Nicholas Negroponte, uh, Wired, which really was like making me dream about what's possible, the media lab, and all the possibilities that we can do with design technology, learning, and so on. Boston, like, really was very high in my, in my list, and so I ended up uh, uh, at Boston University at this lab called Idea Lab, which is integrated digital signal processing and understanding. Uh, it was in a beautiful place, the Platonic Center, which I loved. I, I was very fortunate. Yeah, so, you, you know, so this would have been, you know, you, you learned the fundamentals of AI at the time. There's a few structures that you can use, but how did you use it? What was the first kind of use case for you in this? Uh, new technology. Right. So the very, very first use of AI that I encountered was the original neural networks, uh, the one that we discussed, uh, you know, the most famous being the move career perceptron, but I actually did research different architectures, uh, uh, including some called the coordinate maps, which was a fascinating uh, way of uh, basically taking a multi-dimensional space and 
kind of projecting that into a 2D or 3D space. So it's, it's a form of uh, also kind of clustering, as in like how we find similarities about the amount of data, which is also useful for classifying and making predictions. I can go deeper in that, but I don't know if I should. Yeah, no, I, th I, th I th actually, why don't we start there? Because I think that, you know, I'm going to date myself a little bit. Some people here will know the Palm Pilot. Oh, and uh, you know that little thing that you drew and these were kind of some of the earliest recognition or pattern recognition events right. and that was a that was a use case but well before that the idea that we did supervised learning and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that that was kind of some of the first yes. pieces of what what ai brought that's an excellent point because the major like the first kind of major improvement over AI has been precisely that, where the neural network has been like, where, where basically the, the hypothesis has been like, where, where traditionally AI researchers have tried to create uh, logic engines through means of rules. Okay, let's encode with if then else uh, trees, uh, you know, how a certain domain like expert would operate, like typically in uh, medical diagnosis domains, right? Right, or you know, plant uh, management. But there's like ways of doing that, which of course uh, is theoretically elegant because you can explain everything. You, know? you can explain every answer of the expert system, but it's not very scalable. It's very complex and not really. Um, in fact, it has never really been viable on a large scale. But then came the approach of neural networks, well, okay, instead of uh, trying to build this kind of logical structure, how about we teach computers through examples? And that's what's called supervised learning. Like, okay, here is mimic the brain behavior, like where we have stimuli and we have responses. And so the idea there is like, if you think of the AI system as these neural networks, Neural network meaning made of computational nodes called neurons, then you can train that uh, instead of coding knowledge by saying, hey, this is a photo of a cat. And then uh, say, okay, then show a lot of photos of cats, so show photos of uh, all other different animals. And then after you do that many, many, many times, when you train this uh, with examples and you provide the input and the output, the correct output, then you take another set of photos that you have saved for, you know, what is called a test uh, phase, and then you basically give that and you evaluate. Tell me what's this photo. And then we'll tell you, oh, this photo is like a 30% of a cat, 40% of a horse, and 15% of uh, I don't know, a screwdriver. I'm just like making it up, right? And so that's how you evaluate the quality of the model. And then if the model is performing well, then you can take that model and use it. If not, then you need to train the model with additional data. So this system of supervised learning requires lots of data and lots of computational power, especially in doing the training phase. Once the model has, uh, has been trained, then the kind of production version or the, you know, once you apply it in real world, then that's like not as bad from the computational perspective. But the, the, the major shift here is going from hand, hand coding to, okay, let's use data to, 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 to create the brain, to simulate the brain's behavior. And that's, and that's what still is today's, uh, it's, it's the root of what we have today. Yeah, and, and, and I think it's really important that the first thing you described was something that's very cognitively appealing, the idea that the way we think, the way we structure logic, we would like you know, computers to structure it that way. But this idea that instead, I actually don't know what the right model is and just put data in and data out until this thing learns what a cat looks like, uh, that's kind of a remarkable moment, and in many respects, you don't actually know what the network has learned. Right, you know, it's a black box. You put a photo of a you know dog, and it says not a cat. 
and you put right. a photo of a cat, it says, and, and, and these, and now if you think about just images, it's not just images. This is where now predictive behaviors for, you know, EKGs. You can imagine, you know, time series of, you know, kind of uh, medical information. And so it's been a remarkable um, stage where it can classify or predict. And I think that that, the, the tipping point now is, so you, if, you, if anybody remembers when Watson played Jeopardy. So Watson was the IBM computer that had digested all of this information and given a question, it would search for an answer. But we are now at a different stage. Generative AI is now this thing, like, you know, shouting into the chasm, the abyss, and the, uh, the abyss is talking back to us, right? right? And, um, and I think that it's worth spending a little time trying to understand what is it that has allowed us to make this change from classification you know basically you know something that learns and then is basically just spits back from what it's learned rather than something now not just predicting small things but generating knowledge generating it seems knowledge. and synthesis right yes so uh that's a great point uh and, and the, the, what happened is that uh, when we had this intuitive um idea of uh basically teaching uh, machines uh, how to perform certain tasks uh, by using data pretty soon we at the very beginning we were like oh this is great but guess what we don't have enough data to train uh, anything on for real so the one real database that was used by researchers was this called NIST NIST database of handwritten digits so zero to nine which was the only one really available and everybody did also the research on that and um but what, slowly you know we started to have uh, you know because of the uh, more slow we eventually got to faster computational uh, <laughs> elements cpus and then the cloud has uh, really grown uh, the the ability to scale uh, very, very, very large, uh, relatively low cost, uh, and also, you know, the proliferation of big data. You know, all this data, the internet has exploded, and so now we have much more uh, availability of data. And we actually now have also the ability to create synthetic data to even, like, a supplement, uh, you know, if we need to fine-tune certain models for certain things. So, so we went from this initial phase of neural networks to this other thing called deep learning, and now we have generative AI. And the generative AI is, uh, in fact, as you mentioned, like the moment in which we go from merely classifying and recognizing some items to actually generate new items based on the system that has been trained on all the items that have been manufactured by humans uh, uh, in the past history, which is incredible. And uh, you know, that's, that's what we have today. That's the generative AI, that's what we, this, we refer to maybe as uh, you might have heard of chat GPT. Uh, there's other, and that's primarily for text. And this is what is called a large language model. And there's many, chat GPT is one, but there are many others. Uh, what does chat GPT stand for? Is uh, chat, it's for chat, the G is for generative, and then P is for pre-trained, and T is for transformer. Okay, so what is the generative? We understand because it's capable of generating all sorts of things, and it can be uh, essays, it can be and music, it can be lyrics, it can be poems. Uh, it's really very powerful. I don't know how many of you have tried some of this uh, generative AI. Okay, that's great. Okay, that's that's uh, so, so. See how fast this is, is uh, being adopted. In fact, ChatGPT has been growing the fastest uh, in the history of uh, these services when they have been released uh, in terms of adoption. Um, the P is pre-trained because these things need to be trained on billions and trillions of data points and so you can't start one this from scratch. Uh, so the large companies have had invested the computational power 
to, in fact, create these models. And then we can use them as they are, as kind of general, but they can be specialized for certain domains, and we can talk about that too. And then T, the transformer, it's kind of a term that was tossed around there because transforms an input and output, not quite, but anyway, it has been coming to identify this class of systems. And so for text, they're called large language models, and they're not just produced, they even produce code, okay? But there's others which are for um, images, for example, and these uh, are, there are some based on kind of uh, similar LLMs and large language models, but the, the more powerful at the moment uh, use a different kind of technology, it's called uh, diffusion, where they take, you know, they play quickly, it's basically, they start with a random image that is mostly static noise, and then eventually they converge into whatever uh, image that you will ask them to produce based on your text. And the text input is called the prompt. Oh, just can probably stop here. Yeah, so I think that the image one is in particular, I think in many respects, you know, Dolly and Dolly 2, I don't know if anybody's used this before. They just used Dolly 3, actually. Yeah, Dolly 3, and so, so these are, these are, these are um, models in which you can just type in, I don't know if anybody watches John Oliver uh, you know, on HBO, there's a whole group of people that basically say, I would like to see John Oliver's picture next to a pumpkin. And Dali will generate that image, and it will make that. Um, we spend we spend a lot of time uh, trying to get pictures, taking inputting pictures, and then turning this into places where we've never been before, and that's fun. Uh, but of course, we can talk a little bit about fake news later. But I think that's a remarkable opportunity. Is how do you generate those images? It's a very different interaction than perhaps ChatGPT that many of you have. But I would suggest you try it. Type in a prompt, ask it for an image of interest, and what, what's really interesting is that the way that these things start is essentially by noise and then migrates based on your prompt and what it knows these words mean into an image. And that's how, that's how it, 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 it defines that. So it's very different than the old classification where it looks at something as, that's a cat, that's not a cat. This is, a, again, I, I, can't, I can't say it enough, it's a tipping point where now it's taken all that knowledge. It did require the web and the cloud to be able to access that knowledge. Until you build these networks where you have access to all this knowledge, you can't possibly suck, suck it all up into your model. So it, it required this level of structuring of the knowledge. Again, we're coming back to what you did as a PhD, knowledge, structuring knowledge, right? The infrastructure for knowledge. As that gets bigger, these machines have are more, more capable. So, and I guess we're at that stage now where you know we've talked about ChatGPT, we've talked a little bit about um, uh, you know Dolly. Uh, I, it, I was going to ask questions about what people have used ChatGPT for. So, uh, has anybody written? poems that you've pawned off as your own. <laughs> okay, I've done that. Uh, and later on I said that it was ChatGPT, but it was, you know, it does a remarkable job. You say, haiku for Father's Day. My dad really loved the haiku that I, I sent him, so, you know. Um, but I do think that it, it does a remarkable job. Has anybody used it to write a letter of recommendation? This is actually remarkable use case that I've seen in, my, in, in, in our field is just to get you the first little pieces of, of this, you can actually even upload your own text and then say, write it in the voice of these things that I just uploaded and it does a remarkable job. Um, and I think that the, the, the other big use case is well, we don't, we're not in school anymore. Are there any students here? Oh, I gotta be careful. It's homework. Uh, not just, as you pointed out, the homework of um, you know, writing essays, but also code. And we'll get to now when you start generating material with this, what a copyright's mean. What Absolutely. Those kinds of mean. 
Absolutely, and, and on, on that note, in particular on the education, now, you know, there's a lot of academics here and uh, we all care deeply about education. And so all the issues, uh, you know, that this kind of technology, uh, of course, uh, you know, we have to think about how do we exactly, you know, if, if we thought that the problem was Wikipedia, and that turns out uh, that's like the least of our problems now, because we have uh, really serious capabilities. So uh, we're going to go into you know what we need to mitigate uh, the, the, the the risks posed by by this technology. But let's stay on the happy side for a little longer. And so uh, I encourage everybody. How many of you know Khan Academy? Okay, so that's a pretty pretty well known. So they actually have just today released uh, uh, for the general public. Not for free because they use ChatGPT4, uh, so there's a small fee just to cover the cost. But uh, I've seen a TED talk of Sal, um, who is the founder, Sal Khan, and uh, basically they created uh, um, an amazing personal tutor. And the, the, the way in which he puts it is that uh, it's called Khan Migo. I think it's called Can Amigo. <laughs> and, uh, and basically, it really is uh, almost like a dream coming true because uh, that uh, little chat window on the Can Academy provides so much incredibly valuable feedback uh, and, like, really is a support uh, uh, that, that it's, it's almost like uh, how you have to dream something like that. And then seeing it actually in practice, uh, it's, it's incredibly encouraging. And then going back to my days of uh, um, early AI when I was uh, at the university, one thing that fascinated me uh, was like, oh, wait a moment, this thing is super powerful because now, again, I live uh, at the kind of periphery of, uh, of Europe and Italy, and there are, of course, populations that live even in more even troubled areas. But, so I thought with this kind of AI, we can now train AI models using the knowledge of the top research groups. And then we can ship that models to, to remote areas where they don't have access, for example, to high value medical expertise. And so this is just, now this is happening. Now this is actually happening through this kind of generative AI because uh, what well, they've done at Khan Academy, I think, is a fantastic model of what can be done on top of these uh, large language models, which again take so much. They couldn't have done it on their own. They had to use, they had to be a wrapper, an intelligent, specialized wrapper on top of one of the large language models. But they've done a remarkable job. Uh, I really encourage everybody to go see because now uh, students in uh, disadvantaged communities would be able to tap into high quality um, tutoring and feedback that, you know, frankly, they possibly couldn't, you know, even, they, they might, they're always great teachers in schools, but they, there are not enough of them and they're not always available to every student. So in this case, there's also some good uh, aid uh, also for the teacher because also, you know, we have a, we need great teachers, and uh, not every teacher is uh, the best teacher, and these tools can also help teachers be better teachers. So there's just a lot to be excited about uh, kind of the democratization of uh, quality education. And uh, I think that's going to be the focus, uh, and much more important that than worrying about uh, plagiarism and all that, which also needs to be taken care of. But but this is far more exciting. So I'm glad that you took the you know this. I think the education, the the adaptation as a tool that you can carry around with you, that you can use to enhance what you can already do. I think is something that a um, number of people uh, have identified. But let's then take a little turn towards the opportunity to actually replace that, you know, um, for those of you who are familiar with some of the early, one of the earliest um, uh, scientists that worked on AI was Alan Turing. And he had something called the Turing test, which was effectively, if I 
typed into a terminal at the time and I got and I, and I sent it to another room and then I got a, I got something back would I be able to tell whether that person was a human being or not and um, and so the Turing test was really at the time really the you know setting the standard as to could a human being tell that uh, what was on the other side of this was it a computational device or was it a human being so now with generative AI the question is are there opportunities to supplant, I'll, I'll be provocative, uh, supplant what some uh, people do. And I think we're seeing this a little bit right now with the Screen Actors Guild. That's a big part of the strike in Hollywood is that, you know, if you now combine uh, somebody who can write, and then let's say you can also generate a video using Dali do you need actors? Do you need writers? And I think that, you know, so, so how are, are we thinking about this? Because I think a little bit of what you guys do at Ampliforce is oriented towards this to help, but could also be seen in, an, in, in, a, in another way. Absolutely. So this is a great question. Okay. And uh, for sure, uh, the impact on the workforce of any technology has always had this uh, effect of uh, some jobs go and many others come and so but in this case uh, I think we have to be even more we have to pay even more attention to what really so what we experience is that uh, the vast majority of the type of work uh, that or the type of kind of technology that we offer actually goes to towards uh, uh, organizations who actually can't hire enough people for doing certain kind of uh, jobs which are not the ones that are like the most uh, that require the most skills and they don't necessarily pay the most money so in that regard it feels more like uh, we are really not uh, at the moment uh, trying to eliminate jobs maybe maybe to be fair some some people outsource uh, uh, some of these uh, low uh, kind of I'd say low skill type of uh, knowledge uh, work uh, to uh, you know, other areas of the world where there is like uh, labor available for lower cost and that for sure will have an impact. Uh, at the same time, I feel like uh, it's unavoidable, right? You know, you just can't uh, not take advantage of uh, what's available because, uh, you know, we are in a competitive market and so that's where there's always the argument to be made that you know, you can't just be in a purely capitalistic uh, winner, like a takes all or Darwin business type. But, you know, you have to have some kind of social uh, ways to mitigate uh, the, the, the impact of technology. And, you know, we live in this era where we have, we have seen in the span of just a few years, so many really critically disruptive technologies. The, the chip, the computer first, and then, you know, the, the internet, which you know, I thought, okay, this is the most amazing thing, but wait a second, now we have the smartphone, and like, oh wow, this is incredible, and now we have generative AI. So, technology moves at a really fast pace, uh, the, 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 that definitely disrupts and displaces, um, you know, unfortunately, like some workers. Uh, but I have to say also, in this case, because of the incredible access that we have to this generative AI, it's almost like, why wouldn't anybody make the most of that and reinvent themselves or becoming the super turbocharged, uh, product, super productive version of whatever you're doing? And at this point, uh, there really is uh, practically no limit on you gotta have to imagine what you want and you can use that to create business plans, to write persuasive uh, uh, pitches uh, for VCs or for raising funds. So, like, it, it really is a, is a new, it supercharges uh, everybody who spends the little amount of time and effort to learn what's possible. And it's so easy to learn what's possible that really, uh, I, I feel like the, in this case, it's going to be like a net positive, uh, probably even better uh, than the other technology cycles. But I need to be careful not to fall into this trap of uh, the pessimism version trap. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 
I think that you know we, we'll struggle with this, and I think the Q and A will for hopefully bring this out. Is this question of it's one thing, you know, to see the robots in the Amazon, you know, uh, warehouse now moving things around because you know by AI they can move things around probably better and smart, smarter, or, you know, faster and more efficiently than people. But I, I do think that you know there is a there's a part of society that has always felt that they were you know untouchable you know the creative environment right. you know that this is never going to be supplanted by artificial intelligence even though in its name the idea is that the goal of it is to supplant kind of perhaps you know creativity and intelligence right i think that that's a very let's, let's talk more about this point right because this is really like what's capturing also the news and so in that regard, let's be let's be honest and be fair. Like, if these generative AI systems uh, have been like indiscriminately taking any kind of copyrighted work uh, and boom, throwing it in there to the point in which uh, Adobe, which is the you know famous uh, maker of Photoshop, they actually have their own uh, generative AI for images that actually is guaranteed to have been trained only on copyright free images so that if you as an artist uh, uh, may create a new image using their system uh, you will be guaranteed that nobody can ever, ever come after you to say hey you are like a plagiar you, 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 what, you, you can't be accused of plagiarism because this is not. so that's an interesting innovative concept there with regard to the to the writer strike, I think you know we'll see how it goes. Uh, for sure, um, someone who's raised in Italy where strikes are like the most normal thing. Like I don't see that in many strikes here, so I can't say it's a bad thing. You know? so that's what's one of the tools that democracies have uh, to resolve uh, complex issues and complex negotiations, right? So um, I, I, I respect. Uh, and some of the people in this industry they kind of pay attention to basically say like look there's going to be 10 years of uh, litigation and then out of this litigation eventually there will be legislation jurisprudence and legislation that combined uh, will create some kind of regulatory framework uh, that will make it sort of understand as far as the short term i don't know i hope the the writers, uh, you know, I, I root for the little guys. That's my tendency, and so I hope they get uh, a little bit more of what they want um, and what they deserve, because they're creative people, and uh, we, we we love them. Um, but I also would encourage them to figure out how to make uh, the most. But, you know, I was thinking like, okay, if you're a comedian. Wouldn't you want at least to uh, kind of generate some jokes and stuff? And stuff? <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the day, like one way of looking at like generative AI is that is the most powerful uh, kind of hand personalized template engine ever given to us. Like you know, letter of recommendation, how tedious. But if you just you know kind of do a little bit of a and then you put the final touches, you know what? Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo used to work like that. <laughs> they they had little they have uh, they have helpers in their workshop, but they kind of got started. Then they came and did the final touches, and that's how it is. It's not that dissimilar from the Renaissance way of the great artist. So, but now everybody can be Michelangelo. Sort of. <laughs> I don't think I can I can uh, top that. If we're going to end uh, <laughs> that, it's going to turn everybody into. Uh, uh, Michelangelo and, and, and Da Vinci. I, I will say that um, this is just the beginning of this discussion. I think that you know we are at early stages in trying to understand what this can do, how disruptive it can be, what are the technologies that, um, what are what the you know what are the industries where this is going to change things. So I love the perspective of education. I'm glad that you brought that up, and I think it can be a powerhouse in that respect. Uh, but we will need to understand what else it can do. So I, I wanted to open up the floor for some Q and A. But let's first thank Giuseppe for uh, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, amazing session. 
Uh, my question was more around uh, hallucination, which is often talked about in these models, and especially with applications like healthcare, education, it could spit out very like long answers, and that could lead to obviously harmful effects on the people getting them. Uh, what do you think can be done to, you know, mitigate that to certain aspects, especially as you were talking about the Khan Academy example of wrapping it up in such a way that it maybe doesn't do that. Yeah, that's a great question. So hallucinations are like uh, artifacts uh, that aren't quite uh, true, and uh, you know, in, in images they can be manifested as like weird things, and in text uh, as perfectly. Uh, legitimate sounding uh, facts uh, and arguments, which you know is one of the biggest threats actually to democracy in, in open societies. Uh, but like, how do we mitigate that? But they are completely false. So, the, at the moment, the way to mitigate the, the ways that we have to mitigate that in the short term are essentially two. One you're all trying to make sense of what you got before you like throw it on the other side of the fence like you might know about you might have heard about this case of this uh, lawyer who basically had chat gpt writing a whole situation and then like uh, there was reference to like a uh, jurisprudence that didn't ever exist to code the numbers that never were like uh, ever so so that's that um so Make sure you you bet with your own knowledge, you know, and maybe you go back to your old uh, search engine or libraries, which you know that's a very interesting place uh, where you find a lot of um, true uh, sources. Um, or you know, the other thing is to depend on uh, the technological advances of the companies uh, and the organizations who actually make it, such as OpenAI, for example, uh, Dali three. It's significantly better than Dali 2, and so is ChatGPT 4. So ChatGPT 3 had uh, like billions of parameters, and ChatGPT 4 has trillions of parameters. So, and then there will be for sure another version. So, and each version is 10x better or more than the previous version. So it's it's basically at this point is uh, this whole like specifically the transformer model kind of was a wild idea that was tried without really knowing whether or not it was going to work and turned out works way better than anybody would have ever anticipated but now we don't really fully understand why it works so good and what is really capable of and what is not capable of yet so enjoy your your, your generative ai but don't sign on the dotted line until you fully understand what you're signing, if it's coming from a generative AI. A great question. Yeah, I'll just say that there is. Uh, for, uh, I think you even mentioned one of these. You know the you know the you know uh, gambler's dilemma. There's these cognitive traps that we go on. It turns out that many of these generative AIs fall into the same cognitive traps. Like this is. You know, if you've read Ray Kurzweil, if anybody's read or you've read this, it's one thing to achieve artificial intelligence it'll be another thing to achieve artificial stupidity. And so that's, I mean, that's something that we have that comes in part, you know, part and parcel is that it will make the same mistakes as, as we do. And so many of these hallucinations often are come from correlative readings of say a web page of two words appear together, even if they're not related, all of a sudden it'll connect those uh, concepts. So we cannot supplant experts. <laughs> Experts are still val valuable in that respect, yeah. Not yet, uh, but, <laughs> expert, but experts better figure out how to become better experts uh, using this stuff. <laughs> Thank you for your comments, very interesting. As we think about foundation models of all types, you know, geospatial information, code, language, everything, and then all the places where they're used. So there's going to be a massive proliferation of this around every sector of everything that we know. How do we conceive of controlling all that? I mean, you just told us against hallucination, just make sure you understand what you're signing, but times 100, 
times a thousand because it'll be everywhere you look. You won't even know you're signing. How do we control this? Great question. And so, and so that said, we all click on a lot of, I agree, without really figuring out what it is. But that, that so far, these, these long pages that we click, I agree on, have been written by humans. So now, how do we somehow contain these, you know, these kind of technologies? And, uh, you know, it's actually an open debate. And uh, there are, at the moment, the best uh, uh, kind of legislation, at least, that we have in regulation is the one from the European Union, of all places. It's called the AIA, the AI Act, and really tries to, it's the most comprehensive at the moment that we have for, for, for AI. And it really, in a way, goes with this idea that AI, generative AI specifically, um, needs to be handled like we, we handle drug manufacturing. So what happens in drug manufacturing is like, you experiment, you have a, like, whatever number of experiments in the lab, but before you release something, you have to prove, you have to go through a regula regulatory uh, process that is rigorous, and you have to prove that this thing does no harm, <laughs> okay? You might, not, you might do absolutely nothing, like it happened recently with one of the compounds that turned out did absolutely nothing, <laughs> at least it's not supposed to be harmful. So with AI, uh, we, this is one of the things that we have to do. We have to basically figure out that the companies who create these models and then before they put them and release them in the wild, they have to prove that they understand what they're doing, they're not going to do harm, and so this is um, they opposite of the culture that dominates the software and innovation world, where it's like just throw something out there, see if it sticks, and if it doesn't, okay, we'll iterate. Now you can't really allow that anymore. And if you think about it, this is the magnitude and scale of generative AI has been inappropriately yeah, compared to things like uh, nuclear energy, you know. What's going on with nuclear energy is that we have a lot of regulations for international treaties, uh, and uh, you know, people checking on each countries checking on each other, and so we are going to have to do some some of that because uh, we can't just leave it to each individual country to do X, Y, and Z to try to contain this. So there's going to be that. There's going to be an ongoing debate in the society, in, in the open society, where in the world there are open societies, but there are parts of the world where there isn't open society, and that's a different kind of challenge, where there's going to be a lot more invasion of privacy, perhaps, in these uh, uh, less open societies. So this is one of the things that I encourage everybody to pay attention to, because uh, the debate is definitely early and it's ongoing, and actually, I encourage everybody to, to read this book uh, that has been recently published by the founder of DeepMind. DeepMind is the company that eventually created AlphaGo. Go is this game that is super complex, more complex than chess, and they built this, uh, this AI that beat the master. It's a fascinating story. So the name of this book is uh, The Coming Wave, and uh, <clears throat> the, the author is uh, uh, Mustafa Suleiman, which uh, fascinating story is that came from Syria, much like Steve Jobs' dad, but you know, in the UK, it is across the year. So, and he has a, he dedicates a lot about uh, this, uh, this hypothesis, how can we contain this thing that is intrinsically not continued. So, I, that was a, it, it made me go to a dark place of, early days where people sold snake oil and you had no idea whether it was safe or effective and if that's the mechanism by which we're going to control AI, it's a remarkable way to think about it. I think, you know, whether it is effective, what it'll have to be, we'll have to understand what it can do and how it, what it, how it does and work. Just another thing, because another thing that we do as, as societies is like uh, we have laws against counterfeit of currency, of cash. So, you know, that's another of the, of the proposed ideas to make sure that AI systems need to declare that they are AI systems. Otherwise, uh, it would be, you know, the tooling test, like, 
they would be uh, at risk of uh, leading people into thinking that there's a human when it is not a human, and that has a terrible implications. So we need to demand that actually to our regulators to kind of push that. Yeah, so FDA for AI. Pretty I, much. Uh, that would be interesting. So some of the questions online, I think, you know, this, this I think you, 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 you uh, connected to this before, but I just wanted, how do you control the data that trains the machines? There's loads of nonsense right. on the internet. There's loads of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> and also bias. You know, the whole, that's another one of the bigger, but one of the early versions of this uh, were producing horrible uh, answers. They, you know, racially loaded and terrible, terrible. So that is uh, one of the techniques uh, that the AI companies have developed by basically leaving humans uh, interacting with these uh, uh, systems and trying to prompt them to, to say stupid things. <laughs> and so when they say things that are unacceptable, then they flag those and then they get like corrected. But you know, that depends on humans. So you still depend, you still need humans. That is also another form of bias though, right? <laughs> so it's like so the fascinating thing about this is like, you know, all of a sudden I, I predict that philosophers are gonna get very busy. <laughs> and because because you can AI, never supplant a philosopher apparently. So well, you know the thing is AI is uh, interdisciplinary by its nature, and that's one of the beauties of AI because it really is uh, the convergence of, of all disciplines, and, and you know it tends to be dominated by the tech world. But this is no longer a tech. We cannot be. We cannot expect that the tech people will figure out all these other things. For this, we need discourses in civil society, in uh, uh, ethics, uh, and philosophy, because uh, this challenges uh, the foundation of what does it mean to be human and to have this alien. Some some philosophers actually define generative AI as an alien language. As, as an alien, we can speak our language, and what are the implications of that? You will have to kind of pay attention to that. So one, one of these one of the questions I think related back to one of the earlier questions is like how good are the detector? Are there any AI that can detect that the AI is not correct? Right. And it does feel like at, at some point they're just going to be talking to each other and we're just not going to be listening anymore. But, um, well, that's for sure. They will be talking to each other. And, and, the, and the, we are, in fact, uh, you know, the, 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 that's an active field of research to create systems uh, that can somehow, it's, it's very early stage to even do, but that's another very important angle to use AI to understand whether or not what's coming at you is an AI. In, in the image uh, type of uh, a generation is actually a little bit easier at the moment, but there are ways to, to, to tackle this, uh, and for sure, it's a field of active, active research. But we don't have commercial products to, to do that yet. It, it, it's an interesting, again, philosophical question is that if we all have access to the same internet and we make an interpretation, that's what the AI did. And now you're going to make another AI that's going to say that that other AI is wrong. But that's also. <laughs> So uh, right. it's like being at home when you argue with your, right. with and, your spouse. And, uh, and, and there's an argument because the OpenAI is the one who released ChatGPT, but it turns out uh, the basic research has been done at Google. Uh, and uh, the paper, the, the seminal paper is, is titled uh, Attention is All You Need. And if you've heard of it, you can research it and have fun trying to understand. But the point is, Google had this technology, uh, but didn't release it mm. for a long time. They just took bits and pieces in their products, but then OpenAI was like, oh, let's just release it. And like, people freaked out, like, what? what is <laughs> I can't just do that. But that's, uh, that's where we are now. And uh, their idea was like, if we, can, if we can't uh, let people be aware of that, we will never start the dialogue. So now the dialogue has begun. Now we're in the trenches of it. I have time for one last question. Then there's also a younger. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have one extra question. No, 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 oh, no, no. Oh, no. One and then the other. One, one more and then the other. Um, is there anything that we should be fearful about regarding AI? So, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, so, this is, that goes back to that uh, kind of uh, false sense of uh, false optimism, this uh, pessimism aversion trap. Right? 
right? And uh, basically, in the tech world, in the innovation world, uh, there's this uh, dominant mentality of being optimistic because uh, you know the world uh, only in the long term gotten better. And so, when people bring problems uh, that technology might create, uh, the tendency of the technologist is the one to say, oh, you're just being too much of a pessimist, uh, and uh, we're always going to come up on top, uh, humans do that. This time, that might be a fallacy that we, sh we should be paying more attention to the Cassandras, basically, <laughs> that we have never been before. There's all sort of problems that can be created by this technology. I mean, some rogue, uh, malicious uh, actor might create new viruses that can be deadly. And now we also have the other technology that can manufacture viruses like uh, for very low cost. So there are real risks of super intelligence in the hands of uh, malicious actors. And so as much as we like to be excited about the potential for good, and there's even like a website, AI for Good, that I encourage you to go and look. Uh, that actually, they, they create uh, papers and research that tries to address, let's keep it to be for good. What does it take to keep AI to be for good, as opposed to, you know, bad people? And again, I'll refer you back to, to the book by Suleiman, because that is very extensively discussed. And it's just a conversation, but it's very important. Thank you. I just wanted to see that there was a yeah yeah we'll get we'll get, the, yeah, we'll get the young man out. okay we're gonna okay please thanks um, I arrived late so let me know if you covered this earlier uh, given the success or with the success of large language models I've heard um, commenters make observations on new insights into human language and two of the insights I've heard were one. We tend to think of our language as being very complex, and there are many, many, many different ways of expressing a thought. But what the large language models show is, in fact, we follow, we speak in just some very narrowly defined patterns. If we just kind of repeat the same patterns over and over again. It's not actually, we're not using like the full complexity of the language. And the second observation I heard is that if you stop and think about the way you're speaking when you're talking to somebody, a lot of times it feels like you're a large language model. You're really thinking like three or four words out about what you're going to say. And sometimes you might even stop because you're just trying to figure out what the next word is you're going to say. And it doesn't feel that different from, a, from the way a computer might be approaching it. So I was just wondering if you have any perspectives on it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, actually, that's a good question. And uh, I want to kind of refer again to the Khan Academy um, uh, product that is based on LLM. And actually, one of the things that they show in, the, in this very interesting TED Talk video is that the performance of the system gets better when you give the system some extra time to think about what the answer, uh, the first generated answer is, and then reflect upon that, and then figure out what to actually deliver to the user as the final answer. And you can actually see that type of uh, reasoning. So we kind of, we went from reasoning as a scale to uh, feed massive amounts of data to his learn by example, and then we're kind of going back to reason by the way of the massive uh, large language models. So, you know, language uh, is in itself uh, something that is always evolving. And uh, I, I am super sure that we will be, I mean, if you look at the way even just like the youngsters talk to each other, they use certain, they incorporate in their language things that people of our generation like, what is that? We would not even know what they're talking about. And so now that we have this other pervasive uh, uh, entity, okay, it's gonna shape the way we talk for sure. And hopefully, in most cases, it will be for, for, for the best, but it will not happen uh, automatically. There has to be the intention of our society to pay attention and to shape the course of how we uh, incorporate this into our world. Because if we don't, then it's going to be pretty chaotic.
I do feel like after your question that I'm in the matrix. Like <laughs> you just described exactly how I work and now we just figured out how we work. And it's, the recursion kind of freaks me out. Uh, <laughs> you get the last word. Oh, if the, oh, there you go. Uh, so I read this book recently. It was about like a, a, a robot, AI robot that comes in and acts as a teacher. And so slowly throughout the, uh, through the school, he, he um, like helps the field hockey team and he helps like the teachers around like monitoring the kids and he also does some things like uh like mimic what the students do because that's part of his like ai program so eventually the students find out and then eventually sue to the parents and so the parents get really mad like why is there a robot so my question is would you ever see a time where having like a human teacher would have the reaction that's a great question. And uh, my, my immediate kind of reaction is that uh, I don't see how we avoid that. Meaning there will be, and again, I think we're going to be possibly, there's many steps before we get to that, I think. But eventually, I think what I predict is that there will be a good enough uh, technological um, complement and then possibly later on technological sub like a supplement as in like it can replace uh, you know it, it's really a matter of uh, where do we go as a you as you how does this asteroid okay called generative AI that that's in that collision direct like direction to to everything that we have taken for granted as humanity, because that's what it is, this is the impact. No, this is gonna, how it's gonna be evolving depends a lot from us as a society and what do we consider acceptable or not and where we are proactively trying to shape uh, in, and mitigate and contain without uh, sacrificing all the good stuff that will come out of, uh, of, uh, of, this, of this AI including, for example, getting to solve the uh, energy crisis faster and uh, address uh, uh, climate change better and faster. So, so again, like, if we eventually come to this place where we have uh, figure out how to unlock uh, everybody's, uh, every human's potential, then we're not gonna need robots that take the place of humans, but, I think there will be areas where a robot, and specifically a, a humanoid, some that looks like the human, might be, you know, the right choice. I, I can't tell you exactly when that would be and for what, but I would expect that we will be down the road, uh, probably, not, I don't know, maybe 10, 20, maybe 30 years, but at this point it's even hard to predict the pace of, of uh, rapid uh, technological advancements. But I, I would say that it's unavoidable that we're going to have a, a certain amount of uh, uh, moving humanoids like that do something for us, including teaching. So the, the, we have certainly averted a lot of pessimism in that discussion, I would say. <laughs> so that, uh, I, I'm glad that you bring the optimism. Uh, do we have time for one more? Or all right, one more, one more. Okay, this last question really is the last question. <laughs> I know what, some people you need to go. I, I want to make sure you guys you close up. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I sit here, <clears throat> and I'm not in the generation of really understanding the complete uh, AI information, but I wonder, as I sit here, and I'm very worried about the development of this and the ability to have regulations uh, because it takes a very long time to regulate. And this is really, seems to be um, a, a, a science that's going quickly. And I wonder by a show of hands as we sit here, uh, how many feel worried about this technology? And I wonder if we can ask, you know, just ask for a show of hands. Um, I, I'm sure that it has some positives, but 
I feel it has a great deal of negatives, and I worry about it. So I wonder if my question sitting here is, uh, can you have a show of hands of people who are really worried about this? <laughs> oh, wow, really? I recommend it. I, I, absolutely. I don't want to fall in the kind of uh, forced optimism trap myself. The forced we, optimism. we need to be worried about that. And that's the intelligent thing to do, I think. We instead of being complacent and thinking it's going to kind of take care of itself. But being worried doesn't mean we're going to stifle this, like we, because we, we want to reap the benefits of it. But like I think the nuclear energy uh, example is probably one of the best because it really very quickly right after World War II, the country's uh, former enemies had come to agreements to like uh, regulate nuclear energy, which has a good side for producing uh, like low cost energy, and also has a very bad side because we can be exterminated very quickly as a, as a civilization. May I just say that I think there are too many players in this field to be able to even compare it to nuclear energy. I think there are many many players that will get it started in some way. And so I find it difficult to compare the two. So that's a particular concern. It's a very good point, but that's the best we got so far. But there's more work. <laughs> that's our uh, uh, marker right there. Well, let, let's thank Giuseppe again. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to be covering this topic again at the Science Cafe. This is uh, ongoing. This is not, you know, there's a lot of lot to cover here. And uh, your optimism was remarkable right to the end there. So I, I, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Pleasure to meet you.